So I'm your host, Aaron Spatz, and each week we interview entrepreneurs, industry experts, and other high achievers as they detail their personal and professional journeys. Before we jump in, hit the subscribe button and be sure to hit the bell icon so you're notified every time we release a new episode. Thank you so much for joining America's Entrepreneur this week. So excited that you're here. And yet again, I just, I love bringing on just so many just different amazing guests with different backgrounds, different personalities, different business experiences. And I'm excited to invite a friend to the show today, Regina Ketters. Regina is a fellow military veteran. So shout out to our, to our military, but she has had a really, really cool background in business. Uh, but then also leading up to present day where she does a ton of executive leadership coaching for small business owners. And so Regina, I just want to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, I mean, you and I, you know, I've been connected now for, uh, for a few months. It's been great to get to know you. And I, I want to share your story with everybody so that they can understand a little bit about your history, a little bit about your background, and then how you, how you got into business and how you got into coaching and just your, your whole journey. So like wherever you want to like pick it up from there, whether you want to start with some of your early real estate stuff or, or the other business that you, that you started, like I'll, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you. I think our, our commonality is an, is an easy place to start. Um, certainly like anyone who, who affiliates with the military, very service oriented and I enjoyed my service and it wasn't enough. And so I had an aspiration to, be working just as hard, but have an even greater impact. And so uh, left active duty to pursue commercial real estate. And as the largest asset class in, in the nation, I found it to be one of the greatest lovers of change, particularly um, not just economically, but in speaking about environmental and social and, and, and political issues. So very driven, uh, chose Pittsburgh over every city in the nation to get that going. Wow. Uh, wonderful town. I was so welcomed there and I had a short hiatus that was unexpected that pulled me into Iraq for a year, um, but returned, chose Pittsburgh again. And the financial markets of 2008 and nine were not ideal for commercial real estate development. And yeah. so I ended up getting more into like transportation, thinking more in terms of, of regional assets and how could we set up not just Pittsburgh, but I was thinking in terms of like the Rust Belt, I think is the next, next Sun Belt. And how do we make those cities all that more attractive and stable and leverage the infrastructure they already have to make them thriving? Um, and so back in Pittsburgh again, did that for a while. And then uh, serendipity hit and I was sort of introduced to an opportunity to get involved, not as a real estate developer, but as a tenant. And in a gentrifying warehouse district of Pittsburgh, I started a food business back in 2012. Uh, really to catalyze private investment in that gentrification, but also great cities have great food. And I really decided to step into addressing market inefficiencies in the regional sustainable agricultural sector. And so I became that, that retailer, the in-between for that growing farmer to be able to do more than bring food to a farmer's market, but rather stay on the farm. I'll sell it for you until you can scale up and start doing business with larger grocers. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. It's a little bit I mean, different. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, it's, that's a, that's a pretty non-standard approach, non-standard entry and that, not that there really is a standard, right. But yeah, like that's, that's really cool. So like you, so one, like you just kind of threw in there your one year vacation to Iraq and obviously not a vacation, but thank you for your Thank you for your service. Thank you for your time that you that you devoted to our to our country. But the coming back and then like just examining one, it's like you landed in Pittsburgh and that's not your hometown, right? It's not. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, as a kid, I used to think of Pittsburgh and Cincinnati as the places where people polluted and pooped in the river. And that's why I couldn't swim in it. <laughs> <laughs> I was I mean, that's sort of like a five, eight year old's perspective. Pittsburgh is awesome. phenomenal. And um really welcomed me and still I consider it sort of a second home at this point. That's so cool. So you, so you, so you started there and then like, but like, where did the, the food business idea come in? And like, where, where was the investment for that? Is that mm -hmm. like you started your own, um, like you secured your own space? Like what, what did that look like for you? Um, 
I, I really had sort of the real estate developer hat on. You know, when we think about what makes a certain neighborhood or a certain block or a certain building, uh, both pencil when you're looking at the pro forma, but also when you're thinking about the trajectory of, of that kind of asset, it's going to have a longer life than you are. So really was just looking at it from a real estate developer perspective. I, I chose that neighborhood because there was a 55 acre lot of just open was rail yard, but it was undeveloped and right next to the river. So like this is like the up and coming area for a really significant city that's within 75% of our nation's like GDP activity. Like th this is somewhere, but what is the there there that would bring people from where there was higher density activity? I mean, no one really lived there wow. decades ago. They used to, but it was, you know, not really a residential area. And right. for me, that's food. And how do you activate the street? And I was just reminded of all the places the Navy had let me go and how the street can be activated with food and how in this particular corner location, it experienced more as like a cold, dark glass wall. But if we activated it with food, if we were to change the wall to be garage doors before they were a thing, I was into them, where we take away that, that physical barrier yeah. Um, it's kind of like if we build a footbridge, even if it's across a tiny little creek, more of us make that crossing. So it was both the just I like food and I like great cities, what would make me feel good here? And also thinking in terms of what would what would allow that building to sort of be a hub of continued activity and and allow that the district itself sort of ended at 21st Street and this building was at 23rd. So how would I pull people up? And I that's see. just through programming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that was one of my, one of my questions. Cause like the picture I got as you're describing, it, it was like, man, sounds like she bought like this abandoned little se <laughs> segment in the, like that nobody no. was exploring, but no, that's no. absolutely not the case. And, and you were, what you were doing is you were trying to like draw out the, like that natural, you know, you called it like that, that little district there of yeah. all this activity, shops, um, Cre restaurants. Create value. Yeah. yeah. Give people a reason to come and engage, participate, and hopefully just be a part of building something and whatever comes next. And yeah. I was fortunate there wasn't a venue like this yet. I mean, I sort of researched for a while and, launched a, a business model that was untested. It's more common now that there is a restaurant and a grocery store co-located. But at that time, I think the only one I could find was in St. Louis and financially it was, it was kind of struggling. So I, I introduced a whole beast butcher shop and a coffee house and, and a number of other things to like create this really solid magnetizing draw. And it ended up being a restaurant space for a lot of Pittsburgh's entrepreneurs would come because geographically it was center among a bunch of other neighborhoods and good arterials would bring you there. And it was at the, at the ground floor of a parking garage. So you could always find parking. So even people like for their high school reunions, I would see people, Hey, we haven't seen each other in 20 years, but like we came to Marty's for brunch and it was really great. So it was like this hub of people who were imagining a new version of Pittsburgh that honored the past, but was ready for the future. Cause sitting in the, dining space you could look downtown and you could see the u.s steel building like you could wow. and you would like you would be right it was on railroad street so you could feel just sort of the the essence and the heritage of pittsburgh yeah. while also sort of feeling into well what can it be now and yeah. and how am i going to be a part of creating that that is so yeah. cool that is such I a cool it. story cool transformation of like how you you know how you're just you're you're really you're being forward thinking as to like how you can impact the the community and how you can help shape the future. And that's your, mm -hmm. that your contribution to that. So like help, help me understand then the, the rest of your journey with the business. And then, I mean, eventually you, you exited the business. So like what, what, yeah. what did that look like? Um, so the timing was an interesting one, market forces being what they were and also my own ignorance. So like a number of people, my business story is one of phenomenal success in all factors except the financial. So like top three coffee shops in town, number one brunch in the city, best butcher shop in the city, depending on, you know, who was writing about it. Sure. <laughs> um, right. But 
it took about three years for these five independent sort of profit centers to finally understand how to work together. My business concept was untested and it took three years for me to get a staff that understood that, that the produce department, when it doesn't sell all the product, that's an input to the restaurant. And the chef needs to figure out how to get that on the menu. It's, but most chefs live in a silo and they order their food and they drive their menu exclusively based on what they would like and their own p &L. And so this interplay between the departments took a while to sort out. We got there and it, and it worked. But at the same time, organic food really started to take off. And so I started, I had customers who were driving from as far as West Virginia. I had butchery clients coming in from Michigan, people who were making pilgrimages to get food they couldn't get anywhere else could suddenly start getting these kinds of food closer to home. Um, I got into competition with like gas stations for yeah. organic energy bars. You know, it was just, the timing was a little bit atrocious. Yeah. Um, and my last ditch effort was, uh, was selling part of my Roth IRA to buy a liquor license. <laughs> and I was like, it's Pittsburgh. If I sell beer, it's going to change everything. Um, it took almost a year for the state to finally award me the permission to use that. Um, and that was just a little too late. So oh. it all started to hit stride. But by 2016, I had set some very clear benchmarks and milestones so that I wouldn't be making an emotional decision. And if we did not hit these, where we at these numbers, I was going to close the doors. And so that's what I did. Man, that's really yeah. tough. And th like, thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, that's not an always easy thing to share. Um, mm -hmm. But that like that had to have been quite the experience because then you're going through like you taken, I mean, and like Bravo, I mean, to take the effort and the energy to write out kind of what the benchmarks need to look like, what metrics and you know, what kind of performance are we, do we really need to have to make this sustainable and you having the wherewithal and just the awareness of it, of, of your situation to understand that it wasn't tenable at that point. And um, so, I mean, I, I can only imagine the things that you learned during that process. And it was incredible. And, the, and, and I also approached it with a level of, well, I need to be me all the time. And so there was this level of integrity and transparency that I kind of demanded myself. And that's different when you're in business, when you're, you're dealing with perishable product, but even more importantly, living product. So for example, with my hog farmers, you know, it takes nine months, 12 months for my, my beef, my beef rancher. It's like, that's a 16, 18 month thing to like grow a steak. It's not overnight. And so I was in communication with my, my vendors all through that so that they could plan and, and start finding if, if my account would close, what would that do to their business? So helping them, for example, with my hog farmer, like partnering with other restaurants or using my back-end walk-in refrigeration to store product for other restaurateurs who might not have had that space just to keep that, that whole thing going. So I, I would say like the most challenging part of the close for me was the cascading impact on that small regional food system. Almost all the farmers I did business with within a year of my close closed. Wow. It was like a vacuum really fast. Um, but you know, Pittsburgh's doing great. At the time that we closed, Pittsburgh was just starting to get in the national press for its food scene. And our food supply was starting to make it possible to do that. And they've since just really thrived. So it's another example of how my timing, I was like, just a sure. little too early. Uh, yeah. But i um, thrilled for, for the region. Now it's, it's, it's turning out overall, but it was a yeah. little bit tough there for that yeah. first year. No, and, and timing, I mean, that's, this is just my totally like unprofessional opinion here, but like <laughs> the like timing is, is that's a hard thing. I think like, I, I guess what I'm, I'm wrestling with here is I'm trying to think about like, there are absolutely things that you can control and you can account for and plan for. Yeah. Therefore it can modify your timeline. And that's obviously important to, keep in mind depending on what you know what it is you're doing what the kind of decisions you got to make mm -hmm. and then there's other elements of timing that are completely out of your control and there's other factors and other things that are going to impact that i mean look at 2020 i know that's like everyone's favorite case study now is 2020 yeah. you know how could anybody yeah. have anticipated that those are things that you 
you know, and then now, so like you go from like two years of two plus years of virus stuff. And now we're like Eastern European, you know, armed conflict and Asia getting a little squirrely. And there's just a lot of things going on right now. And it's like, how do you account for that? You know? And so, um, no doubt, I'm sure, like, I'm sure you learned a lot in the process and at, like, again, seriously, like, thank you for sharing like yeah. those details and, and there's, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty more there, but I, I want to, like, I want to quickly kind of then transition into, cause I think it's a natural segue is then like you have now taken that as an opportunity. You've leveraged the lessons learned. You've leveraged the, the things that you, that you really, really succeeded at you, the things that you really grew through to now inform your business. So like talk with us about your business and like, what does that, what does that look like after you, I imagine like what you went and regrouped yourself and then like, okay, here we go. Let's do that's this. what I used in my I was due for another mobilization. So I was oh my like, gosh. mobilize me because I need to take a break. And yeah. quite honestly, after all of that, I mean, I worked four and a half years without a day off. If I had a day off, I was in uniform with the reserve. So I was stoked to just have Jeez. one job that I knew how to do really well. And I did. I absolutely regrouped and looking back on it, I could see all the ways in which I contributed to how things planned out. You're right. There's we think that we control a lot or that we influence a lot and pandemics and things have a way of showing us, you know, not so much. And yet there is quite a bit that we can influence. And I hadn't made you know, full transitions within myself to be the most effective leader of my company. I started off more as like that program or project manager that um, could do anything and could come up with solutions um, but there's a pretty s distinctive difference between running a project and like running a business. I, I think the military corollary, if there is one, is to be like the difference between being, say, uh, a company commander and being like the commanding officer. It, command is so different. And I think small business is even harder because Uncle Sam is not footing payroll. There's so much more that we have to navigate. Um, and so what I decided to do was walk away with those lessons, but not keep them to myself. I think there are innumerable resources for business owners, particularly startup business owners, to understand sort of the blocking and tackling nuts and bolts of business, like forming an entity or writing that business plan and putting together three-year financial projections. We all know, which is kind of cool, they're wrong. No matter what, you're 100% guaranteed to be wrong, but start somewhere, make your assumptions, build that market case, et cetera. But there is a dearth of resources for business owners to understand how to be a business owner. Like there is a human component to everything because businesses are entities, but they're owned and run by people and they serve yeah. people. And I think it doesn't matter if you're in mining or widget manufacture or lingerie retail, 80% of our problems in business are people problems. And so let's get better at the people stuff, beginning with ourselves. So I decided, you know, as I looked at it, and my favorite part of running Marty's Market was the interaction with the humans. And also, in particular, those builders, those entrepreneurs, those, those people who made the city even better, independent if they were in civic roles or nonprofit or whatever, but we're all sort of builders but how do I help builders be better builders? So yeah. that's what I'm doing now is as a coach is I, I can be that person who most business owners don't have. I found it's kind of like every single person in our life when we build a business is mad at us because <laughs> everybody wants something from us and we don't have enough to give it to them. But who's that person that can just sort of like not be affected by the choices we make and be that sounding board, be that yeah. thought partner, and also be the, I need to call you out on your crap. Yeah. Um, I didn't have that person. And it wasn't until I had a conversation with an architect that I'd worked with during my real estate period before I launched Marty's Market. His practice was just down the street. He and his partner built a fantastic architecture firm, a room planning firm. And one day he said, Regina, what do you do? when you're encountering something you've never encountered before. Like I go to, I turn to my business partner and he and I have a discussion and we work through it together. <laughs> I thought about it. I was like, I think I just talked to, it's like me and my 
<laughs> like, you're just like a monologue or I just sort of you know talk to the hand and and if if I had had anything in those years that could have really changed the trajectory probably not the outcome per se but certainly my experience it would have been to have had a coach so that's what I do now wow that's really cool that's really cool I mean yeah there's just there's so there's so much there that you just covered and you know the the human element like you said is such I mean, that really is, I mean, I totally agree with you. Like that, that is the majority of the effort of where the friction is, where the problems lie. I mean, business problems can be solved mostly in pretty like, what's the word? Like tangible, systematic ways, right? Like we can, yes. we can look at a PL, we can understand what's going on. We can look at our sales performance. We can understand what's going on. We can look at all these different things, cash flow problems. Like there's a lot of things that we can review and then there's remediation that we can apply to get to get there or to you know to fix something but then there's the human element which somebody out there listening would argue well you can do the same thing like but yeah i mean there is an element of that too you can do some of the same things but those are those are a lot of the non-obvious thing like there, there's so much there and there's a point yeah. that you made i'm trying to remember oh that's that, that, like that was a point it's like seeing yourself for what you're going through is very, it can be very difficult. It's like, I mean, I joke with, with a friend of mine, it was like, you know, I'm able to look at any number of businesses and I can help people pinpoint their problems very quickly and pretty, and pretty accurately. But then when I'm looking at myself, it's like foggy and I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And it's the weird, it's the weirdest feeling and in the world. And it happens to all of us and it's the me it's because we are meaning making machines yeah and so it's not the problem it's how the problem how we make meaning of the problem that that's that's the real issue and that's what actually within our control like some people need five digits in their checking account balance to feel good others need four some need three so it's not a hard and fast rule it's how does that number make you feel? It's sort of like, what's the story behind the number? And it's not the story just behind the number in terms uh, that your CPA or your bookkeeper want to hear you articulate. It's what's the story I'm making up about that balance and, and what it means about me as an owner or as a leader or about my own stability or my own capacity, like my, my own agency. We are constantly in some form of self-assessment, I would argue it's usually judgment. And I can't think of any more intense personal development program than owning a business. I mean, boot camp, walk in the park. Any sort of like office recession program, walk in the park. Any sort of accelerator, easy, you got so much support, but it's like, it gets real yeah. when you gotta make payroll every other week. And yep. what's going on in between your ears uh, really changes what happens in your enterprise, whether it's a party of one or you've got a hundred on your team. You can only, your business really can only do as well as you're doing and how well you're doing is a function of what's going on inside your head. Yeah, that's so good. So let's use, let's use the last remaining minutes here to then maybe help us understand some of the bigger recurring themes that you encounter and just, you know, obviously I would encourage folks to reach out to you specifically for one-on-one -on -one guidance because what you're going to share with us is going to be a little bit more generalized. Mm -hmm. So I want to throw that out there. Um, but but what are some what what are some of the recurring things that you see in that in that mental war that people are fighting? Like what what are things that you're noticing? Typically, um, there's some symptom or theme of not enough, like I don't have enough cash or I don't have enough people or I don't have enough energy. The fixation is on the not enough. And I find that's sort of a forfeiture of sovereignty, but we suddenly become um, sort of a victim of circumstance. When we can notice um, what we're giving away in terms of our energy, time and attention, then we can reclaim it. So it's rather than saying like, oh my gosh, I need another hit of coffee to give myself more energy. I can be curious about where am I spilling it off? Where am I giving it away without even permission? Like who's stealing it from me? Most business owners are incredibly um, uh, energizing to a space. Like people just sort of come around us and 
partly just to be parasitic and like I just want to be around you I always feel better when I'm around you you know or I'm inspired or I can do scary stuff when I'm around you you help me believe in myself great right who's still plugged into you without your permission like unplug that sucker and then you might get a, a jolt back but I find that many business owners assume responsibility for things that aren't really their responsibility and that is draining so for example during the pandemic all the pivots who's taking care of you your, your customers and your staff's emotions and behaviors are their own choices. You're not responsible for them. You can probably shed a good bit of the load you're carrying when you realize that you're not going to make everyone happy, but uh, you're going to have to make some tough choices, but you're not necessarily responsible for how those choices make other people feel. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm hearing a bit of a boundaries theme there. And, for sure what you're saying yeah for sure yeah yeah mm -hmm. wow that's really good that's, that's one good. of the key ones so i just encourage people rather than try and get more energy look into how you're giving it away and take it back that's so good yeah that's so good I, i've had I've had folks advise me on like the things that you say yes to and things that you say no to and just being very mindful of of that and i hadn't i hadn't thought about it in the perspective that you just laid out which is <laughs> and i love it because it's true is like you know, are there any parasitic, uh, parasitic loads relationships yeah, I think out there? Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think of it in terms of like true energy management, like where are those phantom loads unplug them? Yeah. That's really good. And, and some of them are, you know, customers, some of them vendors, some of, the people, some of them are family. So you're right. Boundaries can be really useful. Um, but others are just what's stealing our attention. Think of all those decisions you've deferred. We are in such an uncertain period. We often now find ourselves waiting until we have more information to make a decision. And that stagnation, that stall is incredibly taxing. Yeah. So kind of like when we wrote our business plans, we were 100% wrong when we put those financial projections together. You're probably not going to get it right, but make a decision. Yeah. There are decisions you haven't made. That when you make them, you will just create just a burst of energy in your business. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Well, um, tell us about the owner's manual. The owner's manual is my answer to that gap of resources for operations, finance, but not resources on the human parts of running your business. So right now it's a biweekly newsletter and I encourage people to sign up and, and see what they might uh, learn about what it means to be human and what it means to be a human who happens to own a business. That's really cool. That's really cool, Regina. Well, for those that are listening it's the owners .co. So you just jump over to the owners .co. You'll see a very quick form, your name, your email, and you're, you're signed up. So check that out, check out what Regina is doing. And Regina, I mean, are you, are you accepting new clients? Are there I can people reach out to you? Okay. All right. Yes. I, was, I was about to volunteer you for that. And I'm like, Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah. Yes. So, so if, so if you want Regina to take a closer look at your business, your situation, I would, I'd, encourage you to reach out to her and Regina is, is LinkedIn probably one of the more reliable places that people could find you. Yes, yep. that would be ideal. All right. So I'm going to throw that up here on the screen as well. Uh, forward slash Regina Ketters. That's K O E T T E R S. So check Regina out and see how she could be of service to you. And uh, Regina, thank you for spending so much time with me and walking us through a little bit of your journey, a little bit of your story and uh, for just sharing with us some of your wisdom. I really, really do appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation, Aaron. It's, it's really, um, it brings meaning to all of my experience to be able to share some of it with others. So thank you. 100%. Thanks for listening to America's Entrepreneur. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review or comment on your preferred social media platform. Share it out with friends, family, coworkers, others in your network. And of course, you can write me directly at Aaron at boldmedia.us. That's A-A-R-O-N at boldmedia.us. Till next time.